Okay, you have to start your video. You have to start, because for some reason I can't start. Okay. Okay, why is it not showing me? Okay. Probably, make, can you make me as co-host? Make me co-host. All right, try it again. Yep, that's it. All right, thank you. Just some technical things we have had to iron out, but we... We are here. All right, let us begin with a word of prayer. Oh, Father, again, we thank you for your good word that is always a, a lamp onto our feet and a light onto our path. We ask that you would just guide all that we say, do, or think this morning. May angels accompany this place for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, let us go straight into the word because today we are... We are doing the subject, um, we are doing the subject on, um, I think with this one I have to actually leave my, my shot up. All right, um, on crucibles of life. Now, when we're looking at crucibles, the uh, question we need to ask is, what are some of the crucibles of life? What is a crucible? Maybe we start with that. Anybody wants to give us an idea of what is a crucible? Well, that's one definition. There we go, isn't it? It's a container which metal is placed in a furnace subject to very high temperatures. That's, that's, that's what a crucible is. Because if we're going to discuss a topic, we ought to at least make sure we define what the meaning is. And we look at some of the crucibles of life. Now, when you have a crucible, the, the purpose of the crucible is to remove all the, all the waste, the dross that is there. And by heating it up, the dross rises up to the top. And then it is, it is simply scraped away by the, by, the, um, by the silversmith or the goldsmith. And at the end of it, you always get um, a metal that is more of the purer form than it was before. Uh, and here is a word in Proverbs 17, the crucible is for silver, the furnace is for gold, and the Lord tests the hearts. Isn't that good, isn't it? So, so the Bible actually talks about this crucible and the test of the crucible. So the, the Lord will test the hearts. So we're dealing with crucibles. We're dealing with crucibles. And, um, you know, if, if I were to ask, if, if we were to ask you, what sort of crucibles can you have? What sort of test can come upon you? Anybody? What sort of test can, can you have? A crucible test? Sorry? Sickness, yes. Anything else? Financial, yes. Health, health in general, yeah. What about a spiritual test? Yes, yeah, social, the social and, and environment, there's political test and so on. So the test can come in many forms. And so you can be having a crucible, and Jesus had many crucibles in his life. Crucible is a, is a fiery test. So it's a place or situation or period of adversity, which comes in a very content, uh, condensed, uh, sorry, a very, a very concentrated or dense way. In other words, this is something that, that hits you really hard. This is not just a usual event of life. It's a, an event that really shocks you and so on. And, and that shock in the system what, what does a shock create? Any shock creates change, yeah? creates change. So, so once you have a shock in the system, once you put that force into the system, it can create change if it, if it interacts with you. So for example, if somebody runs and, and, and bumps into you, it creates change, you fall. If it bumps into the neighbor next door, it doesn't trouble you, except for an emotional response. So, so, so when you're looking at a crucible test, it's a period of adversity that can create change. And, and by definition, it's a severe test. Yeah? By its definition, that's what a crucible test is. It's a severe test. Now, when you're looking at adversity, adversity must come. It is of necessity, Jesus said, that the offense will come. Everybody agrees on that? That's life. In life, most of life is based on suffering. If you get five minutes of happiness, be very grateful because not many, many times you might get it. Most of our life is going to be based on suffering. 
it, it's it's the it's the it's the modality by which we all have to live with. We live with suffering in one form or the other. So adversity is inevitable. Uh, it is going to happen to everyone. And the real adversity of a crucible test is a test that affects your faith or, or impacts your faith, because that's the test of which Scripture speaks. So we just this is the introduction. So here comes. So this is just the first couple of slides on the introduction. The first question then is. How should we respond when we experience adversity or difficulty in our lives? What, what answers can we give to that? What happens when you have an adverse event that really impacts you, shakes you, in other words, it shakes you to the core? How do you respond as a Christian? Yes. 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 Is it coming from within something I've done or is it from outside? Is it external? Yes. Anything else? How else should we, how should we respond to difficulties and adversities in our lives? Because that's what a crucible test is. Any other thought? Yes, ask for, ask for the help and solution that God can provide. Anybody else? You know, have you ever had a difficult period? Have you ever walked in a difficult space? How did you respond to that? You know, wisdom, how to correct his wisdom to know how to deal with it. Anybody else? Because events can come and rock, it can rock you. Do you agree? An event can rock you in your life. And, um, and yes, so two things that you said, you, you go to the scripture, that word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. You need to know where to travel. And don't forsake the assembling of yourself. It's one of the things that we do all the time. We tend to withdraw when we're in a period of adversity. That's probably the worst thing to do. You need to really be in the fellowship of someone else and people who can support us during that time. So there are various ways that we can respond. I want to suggest a few things, uh, which will include some of what we have already said. Number one, I think there are about five ways I've thought of um, that we can respond to adversity uh, if you're a follower of Christ. Now, number one is don't get surprised. Don't be surprised. So here's what, and I try to reference it from what the, the, the Bible teaches. In 1 Peter 4 verse 12, it says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning what? The fiery trials, that's the crucible test. The fiery trials uh, to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. When these things come, it's not strange. Do you agree? Temptation comes and testing comes to everyone. There is no temptation that has taken you except that which is common among all men. That's what the Bible teaches. But God is faithful who will provide a way of what? escape that you should be able to bear it. So he says, don't think it is strange. And particularly if you're in the Christian context, don't be strange. Number two, how can we respond to adversity? Rejoice. Now that's a hard one, isn't it? When everything is going wrong, how easy it is to rejoice. That's, that's, a, pretty, that's a pretty tough number, isn't it? But yet, that's what the Bible teaches. Look at 1 Peter 4.13. 4.12 says that there is a, you know, don't, don't get surprised when, when fiery trials come your way. Um, but then he says, but do what? But, the word but is a conjunction. How oh, are you? Good morning. Blessings. Nice to see you. God bless. So it, it says, when things are happening, everything is going wrong. The honey has come out of the moon. The, the stock market has crashed. The, you know, everybody's miserable. He says, but. But is a conjunction. A con you know, it says, but in, contradict in, con in contrast to. Rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering. That when his glory is revealed, when is his glory going to be revealed? At the second coming of Jesus, you, also, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. So he says, when we're having a hard time, we should rejoice. So instead of crying and having a sad face, the Bible says, rejoice. Rejoice when things are going wrong and, and give thanks. So we said, number one, don't be surprised. Number two, rejoice. Here's, a, here's another idea I suggested. Don't become resentful. That's easy to happen, isn't it? We can get resentful. But don't become resentful. You want to trust in God's, God's care for your life. Don't become resentful. So here's a word on that. Um, it says here, um, it, it says that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto what? Praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So don't become resentful. It is a testing of your faith. And, and it, you know, it says it will come forth and bring forth praise, honor, and glory at the coming of Jesus. 
So don't become resentful. It's very easy to become resentful when we are going through a hard time. And uh, you've got to be very careful. Why, why is it important not to become resentful? Very good. You get angry, and something happens when you get angry. Sorry? Very good. And something, you're, you're on the right track, my brother. You're very, very, you're very close to the answer, to answer I'm looking for. Yes. Go ahead. You get discouraged. You get angry. You lose your connection with God. You stop thinking rationally. Something else? It, it grows. Yes. It's like a cancer. But you know what the Bible says? It says, when that happens, you make room for the devil. You get the problem now? He says, you have now created room for the devil to work in your life. So be very careful because resentment and anger create room. It, it, it creates space. It creates access. And all of a sudden, you really have given the devil access in your home. And that's a real danger. Because once the devil gets access to you, he doesn't let you go. He sets up, and he sets up what the Bible calls a stronghold. Once Satan gets access to your home or to your life, he sets up a stronghold, something that he can hook you onto all the time. So you have to be very careful, be, be, be resentful. You've got to release them. Don't care what it is, release it. Now, the, here's what the, we said, don't be resentful because the trial of your faith, the purpose of the testing is to work patience. Are you seeing it here? First James chapter 1 verse 3. Knowing this, that the trying or testing of your faith works patience. Is patience a good thing or a bad thing? Now, patience is a good thing. Now, here's the, here's the point. If you want patience, you know, you say, Lord, give me patience. What will God bring to you? Trials. Because it is the trial of your faith that brings patience. So when you pray for patience, you're really asking for trials. Because that's the mechanism that is used. But here is what patience will do. Because patience that comes from persecution makes us perfect. So when you're asking to become perfect, you're really asking for patience. And when you're asking for patience, you're asking for trials. Here's the word, James 1.3. Let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire wanting God. That's actually verse 4. Sorry, that's a typo on my part. That's actually verse 4. It says, let patience have a perfect work, that ye may be what? Perfect and entire, complete. Wanting nothing, lacking nothing. Isn't that amazing? So if you want to be perfect, you need to have patience. That's why if you look at Revelation chapter 14 and verse 12, it says, here is the what? Patience of the saints. Because they are perfect. And perfection comes because you have patience. And patience comes because you have been tested by trials. So, so, so it's, a, it's a process by which we have to go through. Those, so don't be resentful when the trial comes. God is doing that for a purpose. Now, here is an important point as well, that in the trial, why we don't be resentful is that the Lord actually controls the trial. The Lord controls the testing. Now, let's see what it says, Malachi 3 verse 3. It says, he, meaning the Lord, shall sit. He is the one that's sitting as a refiner and purifier of silver. Remember, we talk about the crucible. He sits as a refiner and purifier of silver. What is his purpose? He shall purify, perfect the sons of Levi, and purge them as gold and silver, that they might offer unto the Lord, what? An offering of righteousness. You see, if you look at the saints in the last day, in Revelation 19, verse 11, he says, he says that they have white raiment. Remember that story? And, it, and the question was, what is this white raiment that, 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 that covers the saints? And the angel says, the white raiment is the righteousness of the saints. Now, we have no righteousness of ourselves. Do you agree? All righteousness is filthy rags. The righteousness we have is the righteousness of Christ, but God is saying that's how you get righteous. That's how the righteousness of the saints are demonstrated and brought out into life through persecution and through the fire and the furnace of the crucible. So if you want perfection, and if you want to be righteous like how the, the, the saints are righteous at the end, prepare yourself for tri fiery trials. This is really what God, God that's the only mechanism God has. Now, so we're talking about don't be resentful because there's a purpose. God is in charge. God is, God is measuring the test. But the Lord also provides a way of escape. That's the text I quoted before, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There is no temptation. The word is testing. Taken you, but such as is common to man. Now, 
I'll just make one comment here. Now, you notice the word is temptation. You really sometimes have to do a bit of Greek work on it. And the reason for that is that this book is written in English. Yeah? Now, the trouble with English is that it's not a specific language. Do you agree? It's not specific. So if you look at the number of words in the, in the Bible, in the original language in Hebrew and Greek, there's about 12,000 words. 12,000 words that make up the, the, the construct of the, of, the, um, of the Bible. But if you look at it in English, it's about 6,000 words, which means it's about half the number of words that is, okay, that is located, in, that, is, uh, that is used in the, in the original, which means to say that they have to double up and triple up on some words. For example, the word love in English is one word. The word love in Greek is five. It's five different words because it each describes something different. So in Greek, for example, when, when it says, um, I love you as a brother, oh, like brotherly love between a, me and a brother, between us, it's phileo. That, that, that's, that's the Greek word. If you talk about the love between me and my wife, it's eros, erotic love, and so on. So each word, when you say the word, tells you exactly what it means. But if I, I love my brother, I love my wife, I love my dog, I love my cat, it's, it's one word love, but it lacks specificity. Does that make sense? So be careful because God does not tempt. Do everybody agrees? The Bible says God does not tempt with evil. God, God cannot tempt, but he can test you. And that word is test. So there's no testing taken you such as, except that is common to man. God is faithful who will not allow you or suffer you to be tempted above which you are able, that able to bear. But with, with the temptation, provide a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So the Lord finds a way of escape even in your testing time. And when it's too much, he will find your way of escape. But you have to get the test. That's the really message I want to share this morning. You have to be tested. If you want to be perfect, you have to be tested. Crucibles, number four, which have five reasons why I think how we should respond. Number four, commit your soul to the keeping of the Lord. We mentioned that before, didn't we? Commit your way unto the Lord. Wherefore, look at First Peter 4 verse 19. Let them that suffer according to the what? To the will of God. You see, it's the will of God. So, so God allows it to happen. Commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Does that make sense? So when you're going through trials and testing, commit your way unto the Lord as a faithful creator who will not allow you to go through more than he is able and has a purpose for it. So commit your soul to the keeping of the Lord. Yeah, look at what David said last week. We quoted this, Psalm 23 verse 4. He says, Yea, though I walk through the what? The valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. Thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff comfort me. So you don't need to be afraid. We don't need to run through the valley. We don't need to, we don't need to speed through the valley. There's a reason for the test. We need to walk through it and let God lead us. Would you say amen to that? So the fourth reason why we, 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 how we should respond to trials, we've mentioned, commit your way unto the Lord. And the fifth reason is enjoy, enjoy your trial as a faithful soldier. Yeah, because we are soldiers, do you agree? We are all soldiers in an army and we forget that sometimes. We, think we, have, we sometimes think we are, well, sometimes we define ourselves as a, somebody on vacation. We're not on vacation in this, in this world. If you, when you go to Sunshine Coast, you're on a vacation. When you go to Hamilton Island and you don't live there, you're on vacation. You're on a holiday. This is not a holiday. This is not a holiday. This is a war. This is warfare. And unless we get our head around the concept that this is war, we will be very casual when we ought to be very serious. Now, that's not me just saying that, that's the Bible, and I could give you several references, which I tried to do. Let me give you an example. Do you remember when the Lord told Joshua to, to, to conquer Jericho? Remember how many men started off? How many men? So, sorry, Gideon. You remember how many men were there? No, sorry, beg about Joshua. Gideon, how many men? Excuse me. Yes, 32,000. And then, of course, when they went, he said, all of those that are afraid, go back. Send them back. And how much was he left with? Not? Yes. And then, and then he did another test. What was the test? Now, why did drinking of the water make the difference? Sorry? 
follow instructions, but also how exactly you, he said, look to see the attitude to the situation they're in. You know, the guys go by, he goes by the water, the guys lying on like if they, they're in Hilton Hotel. They hang on like, you know, you're not coming for a massage. They're lying down, putting their foot up, bathing, you know, having a good time. Whereas those who realize they want warfare, they, they would drink the water like a dog and look around. Drink the water like a dog and look around. He says, that's the ones to choose. Because they realize you're at war. The other guys, they thought they were coming for a holiday. There's not a holiday. This is war. And unless we realize that we're in a war, we are always going to find ourselves in difficulty. So here is what Timothy, Paul says to Timothy. You, therefore, must endure hardship as a what? A soldier, a good soldier of Jesus Christ. This is war. And so we have to change our attitude with, with trial and testing because this is war. We're not here. We're not on a holiday. This is not a vacation. That doesn't mean you, you must be, have time to rest. Jesus himself said, come here apart and do what? Rest a while. So it's not that you mustn't, you mustn't have an attitude of rest. That's part of your, of, your, of your warfare. But it's the attitude to where you are is important. So, stranger, things will happen. We are partakers of Christ's suffering. We can only partake of his sufferings because he partook of our humanity. And um, we're not having a hard time. What about these people who were torn asunder by the, the lions? They, they, had a, they had a bigger test than we had, even though I think a bigger test is coming. You know a bigger test is coming, correct? What is that bigger test called? Persecution and the mark of the beast. Mark of the beast is coming. It's going to be, going to be much worse than that. So, so if you think that's hard, prepare yourself. More is coming. So anyhow, if we partake of his sufferings, we shall also partake of his joy and his glory when Jesus comes. So five reasons of how we should respond to our trial or testing. Now, so let's look at the types of crucibles we have. Uh, so the first crucible we want to talk about is the crucible of Satan. See, remember we said, it, is it something from within, something without? Satan is, a, is an event that's happening without. Look at 1 Peter 5 verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant. Why? Your adversary, the devil, walks about like a what? Roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Now, you notice the illustration is that of a lion. Why, 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 is, why is the devil a lion? Very good. Who said that? Whoever said that is 100% right. Jesus is, the Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He impersonates Christ, but he is the, other, he's the opposite. He is the nemesis. Nemesis of like kind but opposite nature. So he's the lion too, but he's the roaring lion, whereas Jesus is the gentle lion. So he's the lion of the tribe of, of Judah, of Jesus. He is the roaring lion, and his plan is to devour. Here is, here is Revelation 12, verse 12. Therefore, this is when, when, um, when Jesus went back to heaven. Yeah? The, now, the war, in, the war that is recorded in Revelation chapter 12 is not the, is not the war of the beginning of time, beginning with Lucifer. That is actually not the recorded war at all. That's Isaiah 14. The reward that is recorded in Revelation chapter 12. Remember when uh, there was war in heaven, Michael fought against his angels and, and, and the angels fought and the dragon was cast up. That's, that's, that's AD 31. That's when Jesus went back to heaven. When he went back to heaven, there was a war and, and Lucifer was cast out. Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them, but woe to the inhabitants of the earth. Why? And of the sea. Why? For the devil has come down upon you having what? Great wrath. Why? He knows that he hath a short time, but a short time. So, so the devil is a roaring lion. He's come down very angry because he knows his time is short. So there's a crucible that Satan himself creates. And, and, and we want to explore that crucible of Satan in a little while and see what it's about. So, so who is Satan? Any thoughts? Who, 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 is, who is Satan? Give me, a, give me an idea who Satan is. He's a rebellious angel. An angel that left his first estate. What was he, what was he called before? Lucifer. So Ezekiel 28, 14 and 15. For thou art the anointed cherub that covers. He was the, he was the covering cherub. A cherub is an, is, a, is an order of angels. There are different orders of angels. There's cherubim, seraphim. Uh, there are those angels which are called the living creatures. And so on. So, you know, the angels creatures that have four different faces and so on. But anyway, he's an anointed or covering cherub. And I have set thee, you are on the holy mountain of God. You walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. You were perfect in your ways from the day that you were created until what? Iniquity was found in thee. 
So, so that's who he was. He was originally a bright angel, but then he fell. Isaiah 14 and verse 12. How have you fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn? You, the word Lucifer is the, is, the, is, the, is the morning star. You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nation. So, so he, was, he was once a bright angel, but he left his first estate as fleas, and he became the accuser of the brethren. That's what his work is. Now we know Satan was from heaven, Job 1, 6 and 7, we know he was in heaven. Even, now remember we said that uh, Revelation 12 is when Jesus went to heaven after his death and resurrection. This is, this is before Jesus' death. This is before he came on earth. This is the book of Job. There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And who came there? Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Why are you here? And Satan answered the Lord and said, from what? Going to and fro on the earth, from walking up and down in it. In other words, what is he, what is he saying by that statement? I am now in charge. Correct? Do you think, he, was he accurate when he said that? Yes or no? Part. <laughs> Suppose part is always true. He didn't own the earth, but he had control of the earth. He had governmental control of the earth. Because when Adam and Eve sinned, particularly Adam as the head of the family, human family, not only was it, was, not only was this a moral fall, it was also a governmental fall. Have you seen that? It was a moral fall. But it was a governmental fall because God had given Adam and Eve stewardship of the earth. Government authority over the earth. So when, when Adam and Eve fell, they transferred the authority, the governmental authority of the earth to Lucifer. So he had full right to come and represent the earth like one of the sons of God. Sons of God are those who come and represent each of the planet. So he comes and represents the planet. And, he, and so when the Lord said to him, why are you here? He said, I have a right to be here. <laughs> he said, I have absolutely got a right to be here. Did, did the Lord kick him out and say you don't belong here? No. That, argue, that conversation went back and forth for a while. Chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3. That conversation goes back and forth. He didn't disagree with him. He had a right to be there. So Satan was from heaven. He had access to the heavenly realm until Jesus came. And in Luke 10, 18, in a prediction of what would happen, Jesus says, I saw Satan what? Fall like lightning from heaven. Now that, that happened in AD 31. When he, when he died, rose to heaven. There was the war in heaven. He kicked him out and he cast him down to the earth. So he saw Satan fall. So he said, the point is Satan is from heaven. He understands heavenly things. He understands who God is. He understands how God, you know, the thing about Lucifer is Lucifer understands how God thinks. You know, you know, you know what I mean? We, we, we tend not to understand how God thinks. So I've always shared this with people. I say, I, I, I like to see the acts of God, the ways of God, the works of God, but I like to understand the, the thoughts of God. I want to know the mind of God. Because if you understand the mind of God, you'll understand the acts of God. Does that make sense? If you just look at the acts of God, you might sometimes get confused, as the Jews did, because they didn't understand the mind of God. Does that make sense to everybody? Well, give me an example of an act of God that might be confusing if you don't understand the mind of God. Give me, give me an example in the Bible. Sorry? Are you in the The flood. That flood is one, correct? A very unusual one. As a matter of fact, God does not want to destroy. Ezekiel says, he says what? I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. So God doesn't want to destroy, but he will. If he has to, he will. Give me another, another example. What about Uzzah? You ever, you ever thought about Uzzah? Uzzah is a strange one. And if you could explain Uzzah, I, I can only give you my thoughts on it. I don't have a good explanation. Because the story with Uzzah, you, you remember Uzzah's story, Uzzah. David lost, the, the turn of Israel lost the, the ark um, to the Philistines, the Philistines took it because of the nonsense David was doing, to be perfectly honest. I'm not demonizing the brother, but I'm humanizing him. David the, David the shepherd boy is not David the king. We, we confuse the two. David the shepherd boy is not David the king. That's Jekyll and Hyde. That's two different people. Anyway, David was doing a lot of nonsense anyways. And um, still loved the Lord. Don't get me wrong. He loved the Lord. But he, he was definitely, had a, he had some issues. I'll tell you now. David had some real issues. Um, anyway, he lost, he lost, they lost the, the, the ark to the Philistines, and the Lord says, this is my ark, you know, they put, they put him in front of Dagon, remember Dagon, the big, big god, fish god, fish, the other fish head, 
it's like a dog with a fish head. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the Dagon's image fell down before the Lord. And then he put him back up. The, this is arms was broken up before the Lord. A great plague came, off, came out about that, which I think is the bubonic plague. I think it's the bubonic plague. Now, you, you'll ask me why I say the bubonic plague. Why? Because when, when he, he told him, hey, this is too much trouble. He said, this thing is much more problems than it's worth. Come back and take it. And when they gave it to David, they gave them golden rats. Why would you give them rats? I think it was a bubonic plague. God said a bubonic plague upon them. And they said, look, that's enough. Give it back. So they took it back and they did something which they should never have done. They carried the ark on an ox cart. What, what was wrong with carrying it on an ox cart? That's not how God said to carry it. How did God say to carry it? On your shoulders with two sticks. They, they had to put the sticks through the ark and carry it on the shoulders of the priest. Why would David do Put it on the ox cart. Why would he do that? Sorry? That's how the Philistines did it. You can see the problem? In other words, you can't live the way the world lives. You can't sing the way the world sings. You can't act the way the world acts because they don't know better. You do. And God says, I hold you guilty. You know better than that, David. So anyway, they're going on as they're going to Achan's threshing floor. Is the threshing floor low down or high up? Will the threshing floor, Achan's threshing floor, would it be low down or high up? High up, why? It's a threshing floor. So they would go to the top of like a mountain. So they would thresh, thrash the wheat. So they would take off a wheat, it's called winnowing. So they'll have the, the wheat and, and the thrash together and they will winnow it. They'll throw it up into the air and the wind would blow the thrash and then what would be left would be the wheat or the corn. It's called the winnowing. Anyway, so they were going up a hill and, and it looked as if the, uh, uh, the ark was about to stumble. It seemed to have rocked on some stones. Uzzah, who is a, who is a, who is a, who is a um, soldier in the army, he sees the ark about to fall off the Philistine, um, um, the Philistine cart. Sorry, my brain just went flat. Philistine cart, he puts his hand forward to stop it from falling. Oh, you think that's pretty all right? You, would you not think so? It's going to fall in gloriously on the earth and get all dirty and, you know, he's thinking he's going to roll down, put his heart. You know what the Lord does? What does the Lord do? Strikes him dead. Now that's the act of God. And if you just looked at the act of God, you get confused. What's the mind of God there? What was the mind of God? Any thoughts? Sure, but hey, I'm trying to save the ark. <laughs> Come on, guys, you know, make a little room here. You know, give me a little room. I'm trying to save the ark from falling down. Should not have been on the cart, but that's not my fault. That's David's fault. Very good. Not trusting God. That's one. God's giving him an example. I hate how he makes me the example, though. <laughs> if it was us, I say, "Hang on, guys. Why me? You know, make David the example. That's the joker that did it." Well, that's the point. We don't know. That's the. That is the point. The law. You see, if you look at the mind of God, God is saying something very different. Because God is saying, number one, is you disobey. In other words, there's no place for disobedience. The end can never justify the means. It already doesn't matter what the question is. If you have to disobey in order to do even a command of God, then don't do it. So give me, a, give me another story. Let's say, for example, this is a good example, or an example. You're going, to, you're going to go preach to somebody in the highlands of New Guinea. That's because I want to say something. And there's a tribal thing, and the, 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 the man who's in charge, the king in charge, or whoever's in charge, you know, you've got 10,000 people. He said, look, I would let you preach the gospel to these, my 10,000 people, if you drink the fire water and smoke the peace pipe. The peace pipe is marijuana, the fire water is alcohol. What would you do? Well, you understand the question, right? 10,000 people ready to hear the gospel. Would you drink the fire water and, sm and smoke the peace pipe? Yes or no? <laughs> no, yeah. no, if I drink a little alcohol and smoke a little marijuana, that's not going to kill me. I wouldn't die from that. Because if you did it, you're now saying that the end justifies the means. Are you understand the point? You see, you have to be very clear on that. No, the, the, the end is good. You want to preach the gospel. The means is wrong. The means is wrong. Correct. Yeah, it's wrong. You see, if God wants me to preach the gospel, he'll find a way for me to preach the gospel. Because 
that could you could carry that story anywhere you understand what i'm saying is what you have to do is is take the bigger question of the principle you are telling me that i am prepared to do something wrong in order to do something right all right let's change the story so I'll give you that story let me change the story let's say for example instead of that man saying drink the fire water and smoke the peace pipe he say you have to sleep with my wife and then i'll let you i'll let you preach the gospel would you sleep with the man's wife you understand what I'm saying? It's the principle. It doesn't matter whether he's, what he says, sleep with my wife, drink the fire water, smoke the peace. It's irrelevant. Yes? 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 What, what example you want to share with it? Sure. But he, he wasn't, he, he, that was, he had another issue. That, that was a King David and Shepherd Boy David is two different people. You're right. 100% right. But that's the same principle. Once you are doing something wrong, so the first question we have to ask before we do anything is, is this the right thing to do? You understand? Not what the end is. The end is irrelevant. It's, am I doing the right thing? And if you're doing the wrong thing, then don't do it. Oh, he broke everything. All, all, the only commandment he probably didn't break is, is thou shalt have no other gods before me. And probably that's the only reason why David is saved. That's the only reason, because whatever he did at the end, he always acknowledged who God is. He never turned away to idols. Other than that, he broke every commandment. The fact that God could save David means, <laughs> no, I'm not saying you should be casual, but to, I look at David and say, if the Lord could save David, I have no problem at all. <laughs> I have no problem at all. I'll make it in. I'll make it in. David is the only person that cannot stand up for God. To give a t all right, brother, let's give a testimony. David can't stand up. David cannot stand up. Because everybody else could give a testimony, he can't. He, he broke every commandment. He's, he's a ter he was terrible. I wish I, I time, don't have time. To David, at the end of his life, the guy's got gray hair. Well, and, and, you know, he's giving a good charge to Solomon. Remember to serve the Lord. And to, what does he say right after? He said, remember to kill that joker who went against me. No, the guy's about to die. You know, they will have a little, and he forgave him. He forgave the, you remember the guy who, when he was, you remember the guy who was, um, Shimia, when he was when he laughed at him and threw stones at him, the guy says, "Don't let his gray hair go down to the grave without without killing him first. Like, what sort of king are you, man? Like, that's David. David has some issues, but the Lord will save him. Why? By His grace. Would you say, man? So he saw Satan fall like heaven from lightning. Let's move on because I have a lot to tell you, and I, I kind of drifted a little bit. I don't know why, but anyway, Satan is cunning and he's crafty, very crafty. So in Genesis three five. Now the serpent was more crafty. Than any of the wild animals the Lord had made. Now he used he used the he used the cunning uh, of the of the serpent, but it was Satan who was behind it. Satan is a liar. Do you agree? Satan is a liar. Everything he tells you is a lie. Never believe a word. Or he gives you partial truths. Partial truth is just as good as a lie. You know that, right? Ninety-nine percent truth, one percent lie is a hundred percent lie. If it's not true, and the whole truth and nothing but the truth is a lie. Because that one percent is what makes the difference between truth and error. So look at John eight forty four. You are you are the, you are of your father the devil. He was telling the, the the scribes and Pharisees the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. He abode not in the truth. He walked away from the truth. There was no there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own. He, why? He's a liar and he's a father of lies. So you can't believe anything that Satan tells you. He's a liar. He's cunning, he's crafty, and we have to be careful in this warfare that we don't get uh, fall to the prey of Satan. Now, we're talking about the crucible that Satan sets up. So we're just giving you that introduction of who he is and, and why he behaves the way he, he behaves. But the truth is, Satan is trying to, to destroy us. Yeah? Everything he does is to destroy us. What does the word say? It says that the thief, speaking of Satan, cometh not but to do what? To steal from you to kill you and to destroy you. He says, I am come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. So everything in our life that is set up is set up to destroy you. Everything. The world is set up around destruction. And, um, and, and it's been influenced more. What, what do you think is the greatest influence of the world? Besides war. I mean war, the disaster of war. Drugs, which is illustrated here. The love of money. I mean, they, they know, you look at the Lehman Brothers and that thing that happened in 2000, 2000 and, and when was it? 2008. It brought, it nearly brought the world to its knees. 40 men for the love of money. It's crazy. 
So he's there to destroy us. But what do you think is the greatest carrier of the message of Satan right now? Sorry? Yeah, but deception by, by what means? What, what tool is he using? Us and media, television, television and the screen. They are the greatest, greatest carriers of Satan's pro because with that he can read multitudes. So be very careful with me with what you what you see on the TV. I, I'm kind of going away. I like I, I love I love television for one show, Master Chef. <laughs> God can't get the court. They can't catch me out with Master Chef. Master Chef professionals. I, I watch that every day. I watch the same thing over and over. It's all right. <laughs> not yet, but I, it just means I'm not being exposed to, because some of the things on the media is scary. You know, sometimes I, I flick on a show while I'm watching, you know, I'm waiting, I might be just between a thing, and you just kind of, it, it, it destroys your spirit because of what they're showing. Yeah? What, what are some of the things that you see has been promoted on TV real quick? Uh, I don't know, Love Island could be. Yeah, but a lot of it is, a lot of it is sexual stuff. A lot of it is sexual stuff. And the problem with a lot of a lot of that is that when you when you see it, you can't unsee it. When you hear it, you can't unhear it. You understand the problem? He's going on that basis. So we have to be very careful that we don't get caught up with the, the, the craftiness of the enemy. Now, he operates in high places. There's another point. He doesn't just operate in the low places, he operates in high places. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers. The rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual hosts in high places. Come right in. Come, come right in. The chairs here for you. Please come right in. Uh, if you want, uh, they come in the front. There's some right. Oh, there are a couple right there. Please come right in. Thank you very much for seeing you. Yeah, so Satan operates in high places. So when you think, if you think that Satan is only operating among the low people, he's operating among the high people, the governments, you know what I mean? The authorities, the kings the princes, the leaders, they're all operating there. Um, I was listening, I was looking at some news yesterday. Um, I don't know how it came up to be with, um, with this, this lady with the Epstein issue. You know Epstein, the guy who was with the pedophile and so on, and the, 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 the lady went off and so on. That's interesting what they said. That he, she's kept everything secret, but now that she's charged and going to jail for 20 years, should have got more apparently, but she got 20. They said she's going to reveal the names of eight top people who were involved with him. If she lives. If she lives. Well, apparently it's in the deposition. So it's, she's already told them who it is. It's in the deposition. But they're, they're, so, that, so the, the judge is currently making a decision whether to reveal the names or not. Well, that's a problem. You get the point. Exactly. What, what's, the, what's the point I'm making? This thing is going on in high places. You think there's little people in this thing? There's big people in this thing. And a lot of big people are in it. So when the Bible says we're operating not with flesh and blood, but host in high places, you understand what's going on. Satan also persecutes the church. Revelation 2 verse 10. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Beware of the devil is about to throw some of you in prison so that you might be tested. For 10 days you will have affliction, but be what? Faithful unto what? Death. And I will give you a crown of life. That's the reality of what we're heading into. So we, are not, we have got to be prepared to die. Now that's nice for you and I to talk right now. Why? Because we're not, nobody, nobody's got a gun to your head or a knife to your throat. But if you had a gun to your head and a knife to your throat, what would you do then? Now that's how you have to think about it. Correct. You have to prepare yourself for a gun to your head or a knife to your throat. You have to prepare yourself for that. Why? That is coming. The mark of the beast is coming. And I believe the mark of the beast is nearer. I don't believe we have 50 and 100 and 2,000 years again. I think this is happening now. Most of us might end up ourselves finding ourselves in the midst of the mark of the beast. And you have to ask yourself, if they put a gun to your head and a knife to your throat, will you accept death? What do you think you should do? Yes or no? Would you accept death or not? Yeah. Why would you accept death? Corrected answer is yes. Why? Because you're going to die anyway. You get the point? You and I are going to die anyway. There's nothing you and I can do to stop the march of death on our lives. We're going to die anyway. So there's no point trying to prolong your life because you're going to die anyway. At some point, we're going to die. So if you're going to die, make it a good death. 
To die as a martyr is a good death. Make it a good death. Because then the Bible says you have a special place in the kingdom in Revelation chapter 6. But the point is be faithful unto death. When your time comes, accept the death. Accept death. It's a, better, it's a good road to go. As a matter of fact, the Bible says things will get so bad on this earth. It shall come to pass that men shall say, Blessed is he that dieth of the Lord from henceforth, for they do rest from their labors and their works do follow them. You see, right now we're sad when a man dies or a woman dies or a person dies. The day is coming. When that happens, we will rejoice. You give a round of applause. Thank God you're dead now. Thank God you're dead now. And that is coming. That is coming. A lot nearer than we think. But anyway, the point is, so how should we, so now we talked about how we should respond generally to crisis and the crucible test. How should we respond to Satan's attack? This is Satan's crucibles now. We're very, we've been very targeted. When Satan is attacking you, how should you respond? Give me some answers. Talk to me. Put on the armor of God. What again? You're under attack of the enemy. What again? Put on the armor. Pray. Yes. Sorry? Darling? The first line of defense is prayer. Okay. Resist the devil. Resist the devil. Submit yourselves to God, number one. And then do what? Resist the devil. He will flee from you. You see? He will flee from you. So we have to resist. The word, actually, the word resist is from the Greek word, which means stand against. We have to stand against him. How do you stand against him? By submitting yourself to God. Resist him. Here's 1 Peter 5 verse 9. Resist him. Be steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brothers in the world. So he says resist him. Don't be afraid of him. Resist him. And knowing that the same thing is happening. Number two, put on the whole armor of God. Yes? Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the evil day and having done all to stand. No, he didn't say put on part of the armor. He said put on the whole armor. What's the whole armor of God? Quickly, everybody. What's anybody? The breastplate of righteousness. Whose righteousness is that? Christ's righteousness close to the heart. What again? Sorry? The helmet of salvation. Yep. What again? The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. What again? Having your loins girt about with the truth. Having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace you have to have it all and the shield of faith and the shield of faith wherefore wherewith you shall be able to what quench the fiery darts of the enemy so that the enemy comes and attacks you with that what's a dart if somebody every throws a dart is a fiery dart two things it does burns you and hurts you if i take a dart and stick you it'll hurt and if it's fire it'll burn so the fiery darts when the enemy comes he comes fiery and he hurts it's painful so we have to be prepared with the whole armor of God, or else we will not be able to stand. Don't get discouraged. We're talking about how you respond to the, the attack of the enemy, for the devil is a defeated foe. Don't become discouraged. Don't give up, because the Satan is a defeated foe. It's Colossians 2 verse 15, And having spoiled principalities and powers, that's Jesus, he made sure of them openly triumphing over them in it. So Jesus is a, is a victor over the enemy. So don't get discouraged. You're not on the losing side. You're on the winning side. Amen? We're on the winning side. Look at Colossians 2 verse 10. And you are complete in him. Complete in him who is the head of all principalities and power. He's in charge. So you don't need to be afraid. Be in Christ. Don't get discouraged. Don't get discouraged. The enemy is defeated. He's just, he's just his last. The tail end of his, of his, of his attack is coming in. All right, so we discussed the crucible of Satan and how we should respond to it. What are some of the issues? Can sin create a crucible for us? Yes or no? Sin can create a crucible because everything we do has a consequence. Everything we do has a consequence. Galatians 7 and 6, 7 and 8. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also what? You're going to reap it. For the, he that soweth to the flesh shall receive reap of the flesh corruption. He that sows to the spirit shall of the spirit receive life everlasting. Whatever you sow, you will reap. Now, the only thing is you don't reap what you sow. What do you reap? More than you sow. You see, that's, that's the horrible part of this conversation. You reap more than you sow. If you only reap what you sow, a farmer would not be a farmer. If I plant one grain of corn, 
And when reaping time, I grain, I, 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 I harvest one grain of corn. What, what am I, what am I doing that for? You always reap more than you sow. So you have to be very careful what you sow because when reaping time comes, you reap more than you sow. That's the danger of this thing, except you're sowing unto the spirit. So we have to realize there are consequences to action. Look at Romans 1.18. For the wrath, the anger of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men and those who suppress the truth in righteousness, in unrighteousness, sorry. So, so there are consequences. And the wrath of God is revealed against those who will commit sin. It is just what it is. It is what it is. Now, we're not talking about people, when we talk about unrighteousness and people, it's not talking about people who commit sin. We all sin, isn't it? The Bible says there's no unrighteous, no, not one. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're not talking about that person. What sort of person are we talking about that the wrath of God comes against? Sorry? A person who? Willingly and specifically and deliberately is called iniquity. So for example, and we made the example, there's a very big difference between a person who's, who commits a sin and a person who plans to sin all the time. So there are some people who would come into the church as, as ministers or leaders just so they could run around the church with all the women. Now, God does not look upon that, that that's serious, or will, will, will come in and try and rape all the little children. See that, God takes that seriously, very seriously, because that's a deliberate act. Your intentions are not genuine. So that's what God is talking about. The wrath of God comes against a person like that. So our bodies are the temple of God. Yes? So here's some information about sin. What we do, we will pay a price. Righteousness or sin. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost who is in you and whom you have received from God? You are not your own, you're bought with a price, is what the Bible says. So, so when we're looking at sin, what we do makes a difference. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19, flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a man commits is outside his body, but he who sins sexually, uh, who sins sexual sins, uh, sins against, sexually, sorry, sins against his own body. So Paul talks about sexual immorality, which I said is the TV is promoting that very highly. I, I, I wanted to give you an example, and I know my wife will get upset if I told you, but I, I should, um, wow, I don't know how to say this, and I, I'm, I'm not sure how comfortable I am. Um, because I'm being taped. But let me, let me just say, I'll make a point. I'm going to try and soften it a little bit. So I, I will share this with my son as well. I, you know, I was in, on the, um, I was in hospital and, and operating theater. And I was overhearing two nurses, young girls. They must have been in their 20s. And um, I'm just telling you how the mind thinks and, and why this is an issue for me. And they were talking about a party. They went, something called, a, you know, it's a costume party, dress up party, something like that. There's so many people like dress up party, something like that. And she started, this girl said she had such a good time and so on. I'm, I'm operating. And you know what the party, you know what the theme of the party was? I apologize. Let me apologize on, on, in front of you and in front of, of, of everybody. You know, but I'm just going to tell you what it was. You know, you know what was the theme of the party? Pimps and whores. No, why? Why would you do that? Why would you purposely dress up like a whore for a party? You understand what I'm what, what, And these are young girls. I'm thinking, like, what, what is in your head to do that? That's the problem of sin. Sin corrupts the mind. So that people are abused and abusing themselves and think they're having fun. But the Bible says your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Are you seeing it now? That's where that's coming from. To tell, and that's why, that's why the Bible says, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Because philosophy. I, 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 my heart was in my heart. I thinking, Lord have mercy. I can't believe this girl actually said that to her. You know, I can't believe it. And they were saying it out. I mean, it wasn't secret. They were saying it loud in front of the whole operating theater. What a wonderful time I had. That is why you cannot be unequally yoked with an unbeliever because philosophically you don't think the same way. Do you, you get the point? This is the most fundamental level. You do not think the same way. And if you want disaster in your house, that's a good way to do it. Very good way to do it. Anyhow, so got to move, got to move. So sexual immorality, so transgressing the moral laws or the laws of health, you can get self, you, this is called a self-imposed crucible. You bring a crucible in your own life because sin brings its own fire and its own heat. So you have to be very careful because we have to, we have to address the issues of our bodies. All right, uh, I have a few more and I'll try and move quickly on these. I hope not uh, finish in five, maybe 10 minutes if you give me that, please. 
principles of purification. Therefore, thus said the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will refine them and try them. For how shall I deal with the daughter of my people? How shall I deal with the daughter of my people? So, so God says, I'm going to refine them. He's going to purify them. Anybody knows what the context of Jeremiah 9, 7 was? Sorry? Very good. In the context of Babylon was about to invade. But here's the reason why. The prophet was overcome with grief. He saw, he saw the nation in trouble. He saw the nation in trouble. Uh, they, they, they were wondering why it is God is not moving to save me. See you, darling. Love you. So uh, why does God move to save them? And, and it's God says because of your idolatry. That's in Jeremiah chapter 8. Uh, just giving you the background of Jeremiah chapter 9. God says because of your idolatry. God says I'm not going to move to save you at all. And, uh, and, and, and when, when they had reached that point, God said to, Jude, uh, to them, Judah cannot be saved. Isn't that a sad thing? The Lord said to Jeremiah, Judah cannot be saved at this point. There's only one place for them. What is that? Judgment. So there's only one thing left for them. Judgment. They cannot be saved. And, and, and it broke Jeremiah's heart. Broke his heart. And that's where that, come, that text comes from. So they were char characterized by lies and deceit. They were taking advantage of their own people. Uh, I'll give us something we could talk about that a little bit. They turned away from, from the, the God, Yahweh, the God. They were following heathen gods. You know, they were really in a whole mix of trouble here. And God says, I can't save them. Um, God says, uh, Jeremiah saw desolation. He saw cities in ruin. He saw pastor lands destroyed. He saw people killed or taken captive. He saw Babylon coming. And he told them, judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. So that, that's, that's the crucible of purification. If, if our lives um, are not what God wants us to be and we've turned away from him, sometimes God says, I will bring the crucible of purification in your life. He'll bring it. There's no doubt about it. And it's drastic. Um, and the reason for, for the purification, uh, the crucible of purification is that um, sometimes God just wants to bring, God just wants to bring the sin to your attention. Yeah. So in other words, what God will do when you're committing sin is, anybody knows what God does when, you, when a person is in sin? And, and what is the first thing he does? He sends them a, what? He sends you what? A warning. Yeah? He sends you a warning. He'll send you a warning. You know, somebody passes by and says, hmm, I saw you in that place. Everything all right? You know what I mean? And you go back in the next place, wherever that place is. Uh, and somebody will, will hey, I, I'm sure I know who you are. You remember the Peter story? I'm sure, I'm sure I know who you are. This is strange, you know. I mean, we're drinking alcohol here. I'm sure I've spotted you before. What's the next thing happens after that? He embarrasses you in front of everybody. Always when God gives you a warning, be careful. Because the next step is he'll embarrass you. Now, he's not embarrassing you to, to, to get you to be lost. What is he trying to do? He's trying to get you to be saved by, by bringing you into confrontation. Say, if I can't warn you two or three times and you still don't listen, I'm going to embarrass you just to save you. So, so that's what was happening here. He brings it to your attention. The Lord said, because they have forsaken my law, which I've set before them, have not obeyed my voice, neither have they walked therein. He says, I'm going, to, I'm going to have to bring judgment on them. They're not listening. I've tried my best. I'm going to have to bring judgment on them. Crucible of purification. Jeremiah 9, 15. Therefore thus, for, therefore, thus said the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will feed them, even this people, with wormwood. What is wormwood? Sorry? Bitter. It's a bitter herb. It's a bitter herb. He says, I'm going to feed them with a bitter herb. It is indeed. <laughs> I think he's trying to remove the parasite of sin. But, but I don't think he was treating parasites then. <laughs> I have a feeling it wasn't parasites he was treating. He was saying, I'm going to bring bitter water for you. He said, and give them water of gold, water of God, bitter water to drink. So God says, you know, that's, that's, that's just an allegorical term. So God says, because you won't listen, I'll bring bitter water for you. He's going to make it hard for you. So number one, he's trying to bring sin to our attention by making it tough on us. Number two, when we experience the anguish, we will feel, hopefully we should feel sorrow for sin. Second Corinthians 7 verse 9. Now I rejoice, not because you were made sorrowful. You see what he says? But because your sorrow led you to what? So God says, I'm embarrassing you. He says, but the reason is to get you to repent. For you felt the sorrow that God had intended, so you were not harmed by us in any way. So God says, I'll, I'll bring judgment on you. I'll embarrass you to get you to repent. So we experience ang anguish. And of course, that's godly sorrow that brings us to, um, to repentance, um, 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10. 
And of course, we get frustrated as we try to live differently. Jeremiah 9, 20 and 21, you hear the word, yet hear the word of the Lord, O you women, and let your ear receive the word of his mouth. Teach your daughters what? Wailing. And in everyone a neighbor lamentation, for death is come upon uh, onto our windows and is entered into our palaces to cut off the children from without and the young men from their streets. He says, you guys are going to cry. You'll get frustrated. You would be unhappy because of what God is doing. He says, but that's the only way I can save you. That's the only way I can save you. So those are the steps that happen when we, when we don't listen to God. He brings it to your attention. You don't, you don't hear. He brings judgment upon you. You don't hear. You'll end up wailing and crying. Because God says, that's the only way I can save you. But the wonderful news is, as I try to keep moving on, God is merciful. Would you say amen to that? Look at the same text in Jeremiah 9, 24. But let him that glory, glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord which exercise what? Loving kindness, judgment, righteousness on the earth. For in these things I delight, say the Lord. So God says, I will still exercise loving kindness. Even though I'm trying to save you, and sometimes it's painful, I will exercise loving kindness because he wants to deliver us and find a way of escape for us. All right, let me move on. All right, I think this is the last one before we close. And I really have, yeah, maybe five minutes. So we discussed Satan, we've discussed sin, we've discussed the, the problem of the, the last crucible there, which is the, the, the crucible that, um, of the test of judgment. What about spiritual maturity? Is it possible that God's trying to grow us up? Could God use a crucible to, to make us grow? How do we grow in any field, any field of study, for example? How do you grow in any field of study? Under pressure, but when you what? When you are learning something new. If, if I read a book that I've read a thousand times, I'm not growing. Why? I've no, I know everything in the book. Where, where's the growth? For you to grow, you have to learn something new. For you to grow in your spiritual life, God has to challenge you with something new. But you're not growing. So, so the purpose of crucible sometimes is to increase your spiritual maturity. Now here is 2 Corinthians 12 verse 7. Lest I should be exalted above measure because of the abundance of the revelations. What did Paul get? A thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. So Paul says in, in his own personal growth, there was a thorn that was brought to him. What, what was the thorn that Paul had? Maybe eyesight. We are not sure he never defines it, but we think it might be his eyesight. Because when he was, you remember when he went um, on the road to Damascus, his, um, he, he got the flashing lights, he fell down, and he couldn't see scales fell from his eyes, and so on, when the prophet came to him. So some people think it was his eyesight. As he was getting older, he couldn't, he couldn't see. But whatever the thorn was, it was a messenger to buffet him, um, but what, what was the messenger for? Lest I be what? Exalted above measure because of the abundance of the revelation. In other words, Paul was so blessed. Paul says, there was given unto me revelation such that eyes hath not seen, nor ear heard, nor even entered into the hearts of men the things God has prepared for them that love him. He says, God says, he says I was carried unto the third heaven. Isn't that amazing? He saw heaven itself where God is. He says there is such abundance there. And Paul says, you know what? Lest I become exalted in pride because of what they but you know, you know, can that happen to you? Can that happen to us? Because of the abundance. You know, has that happened to a lot of people? They're great preachers. They're given an abundance, you know. They have the abundance of, you know, they have the eloquent tongue. They're preaching thousands of baptized. And the jokers think that is because of them. From the time you start believing, you see, from the time you start believing the nonsense people tell you, you're in trouble. Do you agree? Oh, you're the best thing that ever came since sliced bread. If you believe that foolishness, that's when you start getting in trouble. You're the best preacher I've ever heard. You're the best teacher I've ever heard. You're the best doctor. You start believing that nonsense, you're in trouble. And when they start believing it, Paul says, lest I get caught up with the abundance, God humbled me. Are you seeing it now? He says, he humbled me by this stone, whatever it is. So, so he says, look, I'm going to humble you so that I could prepare you for what's to come. So he prevented himself from getting, uh, now for example, why does God not remove some of these things from us? Sometimes you get an affliction God will not remove. Do you agree? Give me an example of somebody who had an affliction in the Old Testament that God didn't take away. You remember, you remember, remember Jacob? How are you my brother Ben? Greetings. You remember Jacob? What was Jacob's story? Jacob met this angel. Remember the angel who was Christ? Uh, and the Lord said to, to Jacob, no longer shall your name be called what? Jacob it shall be called Israel for you are a prince with God, for you have overcome with, you have, you have 
prevailed with God and man. No, you have fought with God and man and has prevailed. But in order to do that, he touched his hip. Remember that? The hip dislocated. Forever, he had a dislocated hip. Why would God do that? Why would God leave you with the remnants of the, of the affliction? Why? Control your pride, lest you forget. Lest you forget. You're big and wealthy, lest you forget. God will give you a reminder of who you are. You think you're a great preacher? God will remind. He'll leave you something, a vestige in your life to remind you who you are. So, so it was kept him from exalting. So let's move on. So Paul prays for the thorn to be removed. How many times he prayed? Three times he prayed that God would remove it. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. What the Lord said unto him? What the Lord tell? What was the answer to that to that request? No. <laughs> God said straight, "No, I'm not doing it." Now you think this is the Apostle Paul? This is the greatest, probably the greatest preacher, the greatest leader that the, that the church has ever known. Fifty. Maybe 15 if you include Hebrews. I think he wrote Hebrews. That will make it 16 books of the 33 books of the New Testament. He wrote. More than half. And when he said to the Lord, please take this thing from me. God says, no, I'm not doing it. Isn't that amazing? This burden, whatever it was. No, I'm not doing it. Why? He says, my grace is sufficient for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And therefore, look at Paul's response. Therefore what? I'll go cry and join a tantrum. I won't come to church. I won't talk to anybody. No. He says, what more? Gladly, I will do what? I will boast in my infirmity. Isn't that amazing? I will boast in my infirmity that the power of Christ may rest on me. It's amazing. That's how we should respond to the trials in our lives. That's how we should respond to the afflictions in our lives. We boast that the God is able to keep us. And he says, when I am weak, then I am strong. All right, I think that's where we conclude, I think, in summary. So we could be summarizing. Crucibles, not all crucibles are from the same thing. Is everybody following that? Because you're getting a crucible in your life doesn't mean that something you did wrong. That means sin in your life. It could be a, a test of spiritual maturity. It could be Satan giving you the attack. It, it could be that God is trying to deal with some issues in your life. It doesn't always have to be you. It can be afflictions coming and God has an intent. What we ought to do is ask the Holy Spirit to help us so that whatever the case is, we will be able to stand. Let me give you a scripture from the servant of the Lord as we close. Ellen White, Ministry of Healing. He who reads the hearts of men knows their characters better than they themselves know them. Isn't that true? Do you think, we know, do you, think you know yourself? The first thing I've stopped saying many years ago is I will never do that. <laughs> I don't say that at all. You'll be surprised the things you will do and I will do. You will be so surprised when the crucible takes you what you and I would do. Because the heart is what? deceitful above everything and desperately wicked who can know it so i never start saying i'd never do it i pray that god would keep us from from falling he says he sees that some powers and susceptibilities which rightly directed might use be used in the advancements of his work in his providence he brings these persons into different positions and varied circumstances that they might discover in their character the defects which have been concealed from their own knowledge they don't even know it so so there are three parts of a man there's a there, there's a part that i know about me that you don't know about me. Do you agree? There's a part about me that you know that I don't know. Why? Because I, it's, I, it's outside of my awareness. You've seen me doing some stupid things and you think, hang on, Tony, what the hell are you doing? So that's it. You, this is the part of this thing that you don't know. And what's the third part? It's the part that God alone knows. You see, God, alone, and God says, I'll bring you into situ situations where those secret things are in your heart. Defects are concealed. He gives them opportunity to correct these defects, to fit themselves for his service. Often, he permits the what? Fires of affliction to assail them that they might be purified. So, so God is good. He is wonderful. And, um, and that, he does that to keep us from falling and to prepare us for what is coming. All right. Thank you very much. We have 1043, so we've pushed a little bit harder. But may God, I always like to give you a word. Did you get a word? Is that a good word? I feel there's a word for me, a word for you. Even if we spend, spend a few 10 minutes later, but by God's grace. Let us close with prayer. Father, again, we thank you for a word that comes as a light onto our feast, a light onto our, a lamp onto our path, and we thank you for it. Bless us now as we continue on your service. Grant that the crucible that will test us will be a crucible that will prepare us for your soon coming. So when Jesus comes, Lord, remember us in your mercy is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you very much. May God bless you. I'll see you upstairs in about five minutes. Uh, Pastor Andrew is, is giving the word, so we look forward to seeing everyone. God bless you, those on YouTube. You can continue on. And if you want to join us on, uh, on this channel, 
Please stay, it will be connected. God bless you.